guys, Miss Becky here from Newport Public Library with this week's edition of First Chapter Friday. Today's book is Dorothy Must Die by Danielle Page. Dorothy has gone evil and Oz is dying. Enter Amy Gum, the other girl from Kansas. Amy has been recruited by the Revolutionary Order of the Wicked. Amy has been trained, and Amy has a mission. Her mission, should she choose to accept it, remove the Tin Woodsman's heart, steal the Scarecrow's brain, take the Lion's courage, and then Dorothy must die. So here we go. Chapter one of Dorothy Must Die by Danielle Page. I first discovered I was trash three days before my ninth birthday. One year after my father lost his job and moved to Secaucus to live with a woman named Crystal. And four years before my mother had the car accident, started taking pills and began exclusively wearing bedroom slippers instead of normal shoes. I was informed of my trashiness on the playground by Madison Pendleton, a girl in a pink Target sweatsuit who thought she was all that because her house had one and a half bathrooms. Salvation Army's trailer trash, she told the other girls on the monkey bars while I was dangling upside down by my knees and minding my own business. That means she doesn't have any money and all her clothes are dirty. You shouldn't go to her birthday party or you'll be dirty too. When my birthday party rolled around that weekend, it turned out that everyone had listened to Mass. My mom and I were sitting at the picnic table in the Dusty Acres Mobile Community Recreation Area, wearing our sad little party hats with our sheet cake gathering dust. It was just the two of us, same as always. After an hour of hoping someone would finally show up, Mom sighed, poured me another big cup of Sprite, and gave me a hug. She told me that whatever anyone at school said, a trailer was where I lived, not who I was. She told me that it was the best home in the world because it could go anywhere. Even as a kid, I was smart enough to point out that our house was on blocks, not wheels. Its mobility was severely oversold. Mom didn't have a comeback for that. It took her until around Christmas of that year when we were watching The Wizard of Oz on the big flat screen TV. The only thing left over from our life with dad to come up with a better answer for me. See, she said, pointing to the screen, you don't need wheels on your house to get somewhere better. All you need is something to give you the extra push. I don't think she believed it even then, but at least in those days, she cared enough to lie. A lot has changed since then. My mom was hardly the same person at all anymore, and then again, neither was I. I don't bother trying to make Madison like me anymore, and I wasn't going to cry over cake. I wasn't going to cry, period. Tears or no tears though, Madison Pendleton still found ways to make my life miserable. The day of the tornado, although I didn't know the tornado was coming yet, she was slouching against her locker after fifth period, rubbing her enormous pregnant belly and whispering to her best friend, Amber Bordeaux. I figured out a long time ago that it was best to just ignore her when I could. But Madison was the type of person it was pretty impossible to ignore even under normal circumstances. Now that she was eight and a half months pregnant, it was really impossible. Today, Madison was wearing a tiny t-shirt that barely covered her midriff. It read, 
Who's your mommy across her boobs in pink cursive glitter? I did my best not to stare as I slunk by her on my way to Spanish, but somehow I felt my eyes gliding upward past her belly to her chest and then to her face. Sometimes you just can't help it. Our gazes met for a tiny instant and I froze. Madison glared. What are you looking at, trailer trash? Oh, I'm sorry. Was I staring? I was just wondering if you were the teen mom I saw on the cover of Star this week. It wasn't like I tried to go after Madison, but sometimes my sarcasm just took on a life of its own. The words just came out. Madison gave me a blank look, and then she snorted. I didn't know you could afford a copy of Star. She turned to Amber and stopped drumming her belly just long enough to give it a tender pat. Salvation Army's jealous. She's had a crush on Dustin forever. She wishes this were her baby. I did not have a crush on Dustin. I definitely did not want a baby, and I absolutely did not want Dustin's baby. But that but didn't stop my cheeks from growing red. Amber popped her gum and smirked an evil smirk. You know, I saw her talking to Dustin in third period. She was being all flirty. Amber puckered her lips and pushed her chest forward. Oh, Dustin, I'll help you with your algebra. I knew I was blushing, but I wasn't sure if it was from embarrassment or anger. It was true that I had let Dustin copy my math homework earlier that day, but cute as Dustin was, I wasn't stupid enough to ever even think I had a shot with him. I was Salvation Army, the flat-chested trailer trash girl whose clothes were always a little too big and a lot too thrift store, who hadn't had a real friend since the third grade. I wasn't the type of girl Dustin would go for, with or without the existence of Madison Pendleton, he'd been borrowing my algebra every day for the entire year, but Dustin would never look at me like that. Even at 40 pounds pregnant, Madison sparkled like the words on her oversized chest. There was glitter embedded in her eyeshadow, in her lip gloss, in her nail polish, hanging from her ears in shoulder grazing hoops, dangling from her wrist on glittery bracelets. If the lights went out in the hallways, she could light up like a human disco ball. Meanwhile, the only color I had to offer was my hair, which I dyed pink a few days ago. I was all sharp edges and angles, words that came out too fast and at the wrong time. And I slouched. If Dustin was into shiny things like Madison, he would never be in to me. I, I wasn't, I protested, but before I could finish, Madison was all up in my face. Listen, dumb gum, she said. Dustin is mine. We are getting married as soon as the baby comes. So you better stay away from him. Not that he'd ever be interested in someone like you, anyway. By this point, everyone in the hallway had stopped looking in their lockers and was looking at us instead. Madison was used to eyes on her, but this was new to me. I felt my temper rising. I'd just been trying to help him, not because I had a crush on him, but because he deserved a break. She thinks Dustin needs her help, Amy chimed in. Taffy told me she heard Amy offer to tutor him after school. Just a little one-on-one -on -one academic counseling. She cackled loudly. She said, tutor like I'd done a lap dance for Dustin in front of the whole fourth period. Oh, she did, did she? Well, why don't I give this m a little tutoring of my own? I turned to walk away, but Madison grabbed me by the wrist and jerked me back around to face her. She was so close to me, her nose was almost touching mine. 
Her breath smelled like Sour Patch Kids and Kiwi Strawberry Lip Gloss. Who the hell do you think you are trying to steal my boyfriend, not to mention my baby's dad? I didn't talk to him. He asked me for help, I said louder this time. And what could he possibly find so interesting about you? It was a good question. The kind that gets you where it hurts. But an answer popped into my head right on time, not two seconds after Madison wobbled down the hallway. I knew it was mean, but it flew out of my mouth before I had a chance to think about it. Maybe he just wanted to talk to someone his own size. Madison's mouth opened and closed without anything coming out. I took a step back, ready to walk away with my tiny victory. And then she rolled on her heels, wound up, and before I could duck, punched me square in the jaw. It was my turn to be surprised, looking her up and down in dazed, fuzzy head confusion. Had that just happened? Madison had always been a complete but aside from the occasional shoulder check in the girls' locker room, she wasn't usually the violent type. Maybe it was pregnancy hormones. Take it back, she demanded as I got to my feet. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Amber a second too late. Always one to take a cue from her best friend, she yanked me by the hair back down onto the ground. Fight! 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 Boomed in my ears. I checked for blood, relieved to find my skull still intact. Madison stepped forward and towered over me. Behind her, I could see a crowd gathering. Take it back! I am not fat! She insisted. But her lip quivered a tiny bit at the F word. I may be pregnant, but I am still a size two. Kick her! Amber hissed. I scooted away from the rhinestone-studded sandal and stood up just as the assistant principal appeared, flanked by a pair of security guards. Madison quickly dropped her punching arm and went back to her belly rubbing and cooing. She scrunched up her face in a pained grimace. I rolled my eyes. The principal looked from me to Madison and back again. Mr. Stratchum, she said gently. She just came at me, at us. She patted her belly protectively. He folded his arms across his chest and lowered his glare. Really, Amy, fighting with a pregnant girl? You've always had a hard time keeping your mouth shut, but this is low even for you. She threw the first punch, I yelled. It didn't matter. He was already pulling me to my feet to haul me off to the principal's office. Thought you could be a bigger person at a time like this. I guess I overestimated you, as usual. As I walked away, I looked over my shoulder. Madison lifted her hand from her belly and gave me a little wave. When I left for school that morning, Mom had been sitting on the couch for three days straight. In those three days, my mother had taken zero showers, had said almost nothing, and as far as I knew, had consumed only half a carton of cigarettes and a few handfuls of bugles. Oh, and whatever pills she was on. I'm not even sure if she got up to pee. She'd just been sitting there watching TV. So when I pushed the door to our trailer open an hour after my meeting with the principal, carrying all the books from my locker in a hefty bag, I'd been suspended for the rest of the week. I was surprised to see the couch was empty except for one of those blankets with sleeves that mom had ordered off the TV with money we didn't have. In the bathroom, I could hear her rustling around. The faucet was running and the clatter of drugstore makeup on the counter. Not that that was always a good thing. Mom, I asked. Shh, she yelped, followed by the sound of something falling into the sink. Al Rooker was pointing to my hometown on one of those big fake maps. 
He was frowning. I don't think I'd ever seen America's weatherman frown before. Wasn't he supposed to be reassuring? Wasn't it like his job to make us feel safe? Like everything, including the weather, would be better soon? Hey, Mom said, did you hear? There's a tornado coming! My mom emerged from the bathroom, fussing with her hair. I was glad to see her vertical again, freshly scrubbed with her face all done up, but I had to wince at the length of her skirt. Where are you going? I asked, even though I knew the answer. It was no surprise. In my mother's world, there were only two pieces of scenery, the couch and the bar. I don't start. I thought you'd be happy I'm back on my feet again. Would you rather I just lie on the couch? Well, you might be content to mope around the house all day, but some of us have a life. She flapped her already teased hair and began to look for her purse. You're the one who just told me there's a tornado on the way. It's a tornado party, Miss Smarty Pants. Hey. You need to sign this, I demanded, holding out a slip of paper. I got suspended, I told her. It took her a few seconds to react, and when she did, her face registered not surprise or anger, but annoyance. Suspended. What'd you do? I got in a fight, I said evenly, with a pregnant girl. Who was it? Mom demanded. Madison Pendleton. She narrowed her eyes, but not at me. Of course, the little pink that ruined your birthday party. You don't see it, do you? She's already getting hers. You do not have to help it along. What are you talking about? I was the one suspended. I give it a year, two tops, before she's got a trailer of her own right around the corner. That boy she's with, he's not going to stay. And she'll be left with a little bundle of karma. We were almost having a normal conversation. When she almost seemed like she cared. One second, you have everything, your whole life ahead of you, she said, fluffing her hair at the reflection on the stove. And then, boom, they just suck it all out of you like little vampires. Thanks, Mom, I said. You're right. I'm the one who ruined your life. Not you, not Dad. The fact that I've been taking care of you every day since I was 13, that's just my evil scheme to ruin everything for you. All about me? How could it be when it's always all about you? Mom glared at me. I don't have time to stand here and listen to this. Tawny's waiting. And she stormed out the door. You're just going to leave me in the middle of a tornado? It wasn't that I cared about the weather. I wasn't expecting it to be a big deal, but I wanted her to care. I wanted her to take care of me because that's what mothers do. It's better out there than in here, she snapped. I thought of Dustin and his wasted scholarship. My father, who left me behind just to get out of here. I thought of what this place did to people, tornadoes or no tornadoes. I wasn't Dorothy, and a stupid little storm wasn't going to change anything for me. I walked to my dresser, pushed up flush against the kitchen stove, opened the top drawer, and felt around for the red and white gym sock that was fat with cash, the stash of money I'd been saving for years, $347. Once the storm cleared, this would get me bus tickets. That could get me a lot further than Topeka, which was the furthest I'd ever gone. I could let my mother fend for herself. She didn't want me anyway. School didn't want me. What was I waiting for? My hand hit the back of the drawer, and all I found were socks. I pulled the drawer out and rifled through it. Nothing. The money was gone. Everything I'd spent my life saving was gone. Didn't matter anyway. Leaving was just a fantasy. In the living room, Al Roker was back on TV. His frown was gone, sort of, but even though his face was now plastered with a giant grin, his jaw was quivering and he looked like he might cry any second. 
He just kept chattering away, going on and on about isotopes and pressure systems and hiding in the basement. Too bad they didn't have basements and trailer parks. And then I thought, bring it on. There's no place like anywhere but here. <laughs>